Okay, now that Barbara's here, now that my friend from New Jersey is here, you can get started. I was thinking the last time I talked to you was about a great president whose name was Obama. And then I remembered something about him I hadn't said to you that's very important. When he was president, he recognized that the arts in America were a very important way of getting a message across of a free society. And so he brought the entire cast of the Broadway musical Hamilton to the White House. And they entertained and sang the songs from that great Broadway musical. And that reminded me, reminded me of what Kennedy had done when he was president. He was very happy with a Broadway musical that had opened the same time his presidency started, and that was Camelot. Camelot was a musical that starred Julie Andrews and a famous Canadian tenor and Liz Taylor's almost last husband, Richard Burton. It was then made into a movie with a lot of other people. It wasn't anywhere near as good. But I wanted you to remember that something we call soft power, that ability of American culture to speak to large groups of people is often not recognized. And you should recognize it now because last week they announced the winners of the awards. You know those? They come out every so often, the president goes to the Kennedy Center and shakes everyone's hand. And so it's happening again in the uh, Biden administration. There's a certain acknowledgement about the arts, but we're not gonna talk about the arts today as much as my friend wants to. My friend is sitting over there. Uh, we are gonna talk about a strange group of people, the Scandinavians. I see you raised your hand. And they had a very, very big influence in their day. They were first called Vikings, people of the North, Northmen. And they were very troublesome people. Uh, they staged a raid on Paris. They took their long boats and went up the Seine all the way to Paris. And that got the French king very worried. So he put a big chain across the Seine. But that didn't keep the Northmen because they'd get out of their boats, walk around the chain and get back in their boats and come up and still do damage. So finally, the French king said, I will outsmart them. What I will do is get a group of those Vikings, these Northmen, and have them live here with us. And I will put them in Normandy. And if they're in Normandy, then no Northmen can get up there because they will beat the hell out of them if they try and get up there. And that's how Normandy was settled by Vikings. And as the years went by, they turned into Normans. And then they decided it wasn't big enough for them. And so then they decided that William the Conqueror did the deciding he would invade England. And he did, and it's called the Norman Conquest. He beat the king, King Harold, at a famous battle at Hastings. And then he took London and he turned London into a somewhat French speaking city. I know that seems strange to you, but it's true nevertheless. And so you have the Normans all the way in good old London town. And they built something that would remind everybody of how powerful they were. The Tower of London is a Norman building, still standing today, still housing the royal crown jewels today, and still the place where many very innocent women went to their death because there is a very avaricious mean-spirited king known as Henry VIII, and he wanted to keep getting rid of his wives. And so he sent them to the tower. And the first the woman to the tower was Anne Boleyn, the actual mother of Elizabeth I. And other women went to the tower, lost their heads as the 
tyrant that was Henry continued to rule. Now you can trace all of this if you know anything about language, because all those words that end in T-I-O-N are French words, addition. You just say addition. You can think of all the others that come your way that are derived from the Norman conquest of England. So that's one group of people, but the basic Vikings themselves were not interested in so much territory as they were in raids. So we'll talk about them for a while. They went east and they went west. When they went east, they crossed that great sea that today we call the Baltic. And when you get to the other side of the Baltic, where are you? You're in Russia. In fact, you're in a very famous city, St. Petersburg. And St. Petersburg is on a river. If you go up the river, you'll come to a great lake, Lake Lodega. If you keep on that river, you can go all the way to Moscow. And if you keep going from there, you can go all the way down to, well, the Caspian Sea, for instance, or if you go and cross over to the Don. So what am I telling you? When you find Viking ruins, which you do all over the place, you find them full of coins, and the coins are from Baghdad, the Abbasid dynasty, and from Constantinople, from those famous Turks. So you have a great number of Viking treasure troves that have been found through the decades, through the centuries, on islands, particularly islands off from Sweden. You must remember that in the early centuries, there was no Norway. I know that kills Norwegians to think of, but Sweden was everything. It was Norway, Sweden, and a great part of Finland. So it was the Northmen. And they were a very strong group, powerful group. And they not only went all the way east, that is to St. Petersburg, Moscow, down the great rivers like the Don, the Dnieper, and visited other countries and came back. And when they came back, they usually buried their loot. It was the gold, silver coins that they collected. And then sometimes they forgot them or they were killed and nobody knew and remembered. And centuries later, these places were found. And so we have a trace by following the loot, the stolen goods of the Vikings. Now the other end, they went west, not east. They knew a lot about the geography of their place. They island hopped. So if you sail out of Norway, say, which is part of the North, you come to Iceland, or before that, you come to those northern islands in the British Isles called the Hebrides. Hebrides, Iceland, Greenland, and then suddenly you're in Newfoundland and Labrador. And so I hate to tell you, but Columbus was not the first person to come to the New World. It was the Vikings. And they left a lot of information about themselves. And they were a very powerful group, but they weren't interested as the Spaniards were when they come many, many hundreds of years later with Columbus in settlement. They were just visiting, raiding, and taking. And so you have Vikings coming in the north and in the west and in the east. I'll give you a little example. They love to raid England. It was rich in monasteries. There's a wonderful movie we will be showing you soon called The Viking. The film stars Kirk Douglas as a Viking, Janet Lee as a Viking woman, and Tony Curtis. And it's in color. And it was actually filmed in Norway because what you want to see are these fabulous fjords that figure their way up into the heartland of Norway. And you get to see them if you go to the movie. And it will be coming up soon here in Piedmont Gardens, the Vikings. Now, what else can I tell you about them? Well, they were only one of the many troubles that Europe had at this time. This was the time of the decline of the Roman Empire. And they were declining in all directions. 
So you find that a strange group of people from Central Asia had moved into the basin of the Danube River. They call themselves Magyars. You call them Hungarians today. And they were very fierce people. And they were Huns. That's what the West called them. And when they came down to raid, they came all the way to Rome and they attacked Rome. And so the Pope went out to meet them. This is a city that used to have a million people in it, the height of the Roman Empire, and now it declined to 60,000. And so the decline takes in, the Pope comes out, and many centuries later, the way you know that is that there is a famous opera. The opera is called Attila. It's by Giuseppe Verdi. And here again, you have the great stretch of imagination. You have to imagine, and you can do that if you come to San Francisco Opera, when Samuel Remy is singing Attila. One, he sort of looks like a hun. He's tall, well-structured, and he only wears a little loincloth. As he's a barbarian, there is the Pope and all of his grandeur and this barbarian, but they're negotiating so that the Huns do not burn down Rome. But you've got to meet these people in different areas at different times. Centuries later, you're going to meet a man named Greek, who's a major composer, and he's Norwegian, and he leaves behind a wonderful series of piano and other works for instruments. And all the way across this northern tier, let me give you an example. On one side, there's Norway, Edward Grieg. On the other side, there's Finland. I don't know if you know many great Finnish composers and singers, but they are there. Let me give you one. The man who made Los Angeles famous musically was not from Los Angeles. He wasn't even from the United States. He's a great Finnish conductor, Ezra Pekka Salomon, and he put LA on the map in classical music. Then there was a woman who was a great singer. Her name is Karita Matale. She is also a Scandinavian. And then there's another woman who works in Paris and she composes new and modern music of which we've only heard one major piece when here in San Francisco. So I'll tell you a famous story about Matile. Matile is very, very beautiful. She's statuesque like many Scandinavian women are. And she sang once a very famous opera role, Salome. And in Salome, there's the dance of the seven veils. And I know this will shock you. And usually when someone sings it, like Brigitte Nielsen, she just takes a scarf and pulls it back and forth, and drops the scarf and that's it. And Carita Medellin thought that that was silly, that the role calls for the dance of the seven veils. And when the seven veils are drawn, there she is in her birthday suit. So she sang it at the Metropolitan Opera and when she took off the last veil, she was nude. And this shocked the audience at the Met. But I want to tell you something. It woke up all those old brokers and lawyers who hate going to the opera. And when they heard what was going on, the place was packed with old brokers <laughs> and lawyers. So they could see the great Carita Matale in her famous Salome. We've had her several times at San Francisco, but not in, and not in Salome. So there are a number of things that you can think of when you think of these very different kinds of people. They inspired operas. They helped get the world settled. Now, when they got started and they came to this country, they turned into Swedes no longer just Scandinavian Northmen 
but just good old Swedes. And they loved one part of our country. It has a wonderful university in Madison and the wonderful state is Wisconsin. And you can see that they have a different view of life than we do. Because as the years went by, they changed their attitude about many things. In fact, it was Sweden in particular to where you went if you were opposed to the Vietnam War because they let in all the Americans who wanted to go there to avoid the draft. And they stay there until they were forgiven for having avoided the draft. So you have this amazing change in the makeup of the Swedish people and the Northmen. And so you have finally a whole state of people who become dairymen. I don't know if any of you have been to Madison, Wisconsin. Madison has a great university, and it has also towns like Milwaukee, which are now are German, and they are Swedish, but the Swedes are everywhere within the state. And they show you their imprint because Sweden, as it became modern, became what we call the social democracy. And in the social democracy, they believe in healthcare way before you ever heard of it from Obama. And so what you have is a senator from Wisconsin, La Follette. And La Follette also believed in healthcare. So way before even Franklin Roosevelt thought of all the things that gave us the New Deal, they had a form of healthcare only in the state of Wisconsin given the problems that they had with delivery of healthcare. Now, I will say one thing for California. We did the same thing, amazingly, as backward as we are as a state, we did have a man named Kaiser, and he was very interested in healthcare for his workers. And so he gave us the Kaiser Hospital. There's one right down the street here. And one of the nice things that happens to you, one of the very few, is when you retire from Berkeley and you don't have to go there and talk to students anymore, you can take into your retirement with you the Kaiser plan. So when I retired, lo and behold, I had my own little health care way before Obamacare was going to take care of me. There was Kaiser. So we had Kaiser care here in La Follette's plan. He was a very powerful senator, and he was a senator who very much supported. FDR, but FDR knew that our policies were fee for service. That was because the American Medical Association was very, very conservative and they didn't believe in socialized medicine. I can show you that in one particular case. When Churchill was de-elected, when Churchill ran and lost the election, right as the war came to an end in Europe, and Labour Party came to power, Americans were absolutely flabbergasted that Labour was going to socialize medicine, and they did. And England has to this very day a very robust national health system. And the national health, as it's practiced by the British, is a way of saying, you can do anything you want to. We will cover you. But if you can afford to have fee for service, you can pay for it also. And then you can go to the doctor of your choice. So in Britain, they have the two systems together. But I tell you what, most of the British people I know have gotten very used to the uh, system that you have now. So I'm getting a little confused because I learned today that one of my best friends in Steve Nungarden, all of you might know her. Her name is Pamela, Pamela Robinson. Uh, she's very, very ill. And they've called her hospice. And uh, So you have a different system, the system that we have in Wisconsin, 
And now we have Obamacare, which takes care of everybody. And Obama's people actually looked at um, the national health system that was Kaiser as one of the models that they would want to have uh, if they had to go that way. They, Obama was very careful. Not only was he very aware of popular things like bringing that the musical to the White House, but he was very careful about what he did to disturb the American psyche as to how it felt about these major policy changes. So this leads us far away from Viking So, And what can I tell you? Well, I can tell you another thing that you might know a lot about, not everything. The Vikings turned into movie stars. That might sound strange to you that these fierce seagoing raiders who pillaged and swim around burning down Paris, striking at various groups would end up being movie stars, but they did. In the 20th century, when we still had just talkies, you remember talkies, I guess. Some of you might have been alive then. The, uh, a woman left Sweden. She was, uh, she had the face that looked like it was carved in Carrara marble, incredibly beautiful. Her name was Greta Gustafsson. Gustafsson was too difficult to spell for Hollywood moguls. So they changed her name into Greta Garbo. And she became the sensation of MGM. First, she made a number of very famous silent films, Devil in the Flesh. And then the time came for her to transcend and move into sound. So they searched search for a vehicle because lots of old talkies excuse me, old silent stars were not very good with sound. So they waited and waited and they finally bought a play by Eugene O'Neill, the great Irish playwright, it's called Anna Christie. And they said, this is a vehicle that brings Garbo into sound. So all they did was the advertising campaign was Garbo talks, that's all you heard. And when the movie opens, She's there on the waterfront in New York, the Lower East Side, I think. And she's walking to a bar and she sits down and then she speaks. She says, give me a whiskey. And she could really speak and people could understand. And so suddenly a star was reborn now, she wasn't the only one who was trying to get reborn. Everyone in Hollywood wanted to be able to go into the talkies. And the one who was going to go in next was her lover, John Gilbert. And he didn't transcend well. He had a very high, squeaky voice. And that was the death knell. He disappeared from films, unless she would have him back again. And she did once in Queen Cristiano. So Garbo went on making a huge amount of money for MGM. She was our leading money maker, their great star. She's often misquoted. When she finally left film, she did not say, I want to be alone. She said, I want to be left alone. There's a lot of difference from being alone. In fact, she retired in New York City. She was often seen walking up and down Madison Avenue going to antique shops. She also dated very famous Americans, Leopold Strakowski, the conductor, and my favorite politician of all times, man who should have been president, Adlai Stevenson, was often seen escorting her around town. And she lived a long life and she died, as we all will do, long after she had faded. Now, one of the reasons she faded was Maybe you don't know how movies make money, but they make them with great amount of remittances. That is, 
Before World War II, during the 20s and during the 30s, Hollywood films were very popular in Europe. So whether it's Gone with the Wind or whether it's, let's say one of the Garbo greats, uh, Queens of Stan is a good one. They got remittances. And what happened was when World War II broke out, the remittances died. Continental Europe was in the hands of the Nazis. They were not likely to send money to the United States. So Garbo quit just in the right time because there were no more money coming from the Garbo films that had been made. Camille, all the other films were there to rent. We have them in my apartment now because I have a big collection of films left to me by Gene Dunn. And all the Garbo films are there. So you had this great invasion first. And right after Garbo fades, then comes another Swedish Hollywood star. Her name is Ingrid Bergman. They don't change her name. And she becomes a great star. She stars in many films like The Bells of St. Mary's, where she plays a nun, or St. Joan, where she plays a saint. She got in trouble because she fell in love with an Italian. Italians are always tricky people to fall in love with. And uh, this Italian was Roberto Rossellini. And Rossellini was very famous in his day. He made uh, two films that attracted Bergman's attention. One was Paisan and one was Open City. And these films got her interested because she was tired of making uh, little films with Gary Grant, like that wonderful Hitchcock film that the two of them made. And so she wanted to make these rough and tumble films. So she wrote Rossellini and he invited her over and they made together a film called Stromboli. Stromboli is an island off the coast of Italy. It has a very famous erupting volcano. And this was a story about a displaced person. You might not know it, but that after the war was over, most of Europe was in complete disarray. All the Jews that were alive, that is six million were dead, places like Auschwitz, those who were alive tried to get out of Europe. And many of them did, and they went to Israel. Others just were in displaced persons camps. And so this film is about a woman, Ingrid Merkman plays her, who's a displaced person. And she goes to the island of Stromboli. And then she has this love affair with this man. In those days, I can't tell you how prudish Hollywood was since they were going to have a love affair. And you would never use the F word in Hollywood in those days. They, the two displaced people, one man and one Ingrid Bergman, were on the beach together and their feet wrapped around each other. And that was love making in Hollywood in the late and early 50s. So, Unfortunately, Bergman's career came to a rapid close because she got pregnant. Her husband, who was a Swedish doctor living in Hollywood, Lindstrom was his name, refused to give her a divorce. So she gave birth to the girl child and she was condemned in the United States Senate. Can you believe that the United States Senate had the time to worry about a film star being pregnant and the world was going to hell in a handbasket? There had been Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There was the Cold War. There were other important things to do than worry about who Ingrid Bergman was being seen with. Nevertheless, she was condemned in the Senate. Many people condemned her. And she was not welcome back in Hollywood over 10 years, and then we changed our mind, lucky us. 
And she came back to us in a very famous film, Anastasia, where she played a woman who said she was, in fact, the last daughter of the Tsar of the Russians. And since most of us believe that the Tsar's family was killed in a small railroad town west of Moscow, we found it hard to believe. But in fact, when you saw the film, first it was a play, and the play had a wonderful actress working as the former dowager queen of the Danes. She's a Danish woman. And Helen Hayes played her. And her sister was the Tsarina of all the Russians, and she had been killed. But she had known the young Anastasia as a young girl. So in the famous recognition scene at the end of the movie, Anastasia does go and meet this. Her name was Dagmar, actually. And the woman recognizes her as Anastasia. So you have this very famous movie. Yul Brynner is in it, a number of other famous people. And it's Bergman's return to the screen in America. And she was accepted. She won another Academy Award. She'd won several already. And she went on to have a very useful life. And then she went back to Europe where she felt more at home. And she went on the London stage and on the Paris stage. And it was in Paris that she developed breast cancer. And rather than have it operated on right away, she finished the run of the play, which was a deadly decision because when she went in for the operation, the cancer had metastasized and she was she died soon after. So that was the end of the Garbo Bergman Swedes as Hollywood personalities, but no one had been watching closely. I was living in Germany at the time. And there was a film, The Schweigen, The Silence. And it was made by a very strange Swede by the name of Ingmar Bergman, who was one of the giants of European cinema. In fact, he was a giant of world cinema. And he went on and made an enormous number of very successful films. Usually they were very dark, as Scandinavian things seem to be, although he did make one comedy. But he made these films in large number with his own group of women. He is the one who launched the career of Liv Ullman. Some of you must know that name. She's a wonderful actress. And a number of other women, B.B. Anderson and all the rest, part of the Ingmar Bergman group. This was when European cinema was recovering from the war. And many people were famous for their uh, cinema that they gave to their own nation. While Bergman was doing this, Ingmar Bergman, that is, Truffaut was doing it in France. Um, a number of famous uh, giants in the Italian cinema were doing it, not just Rossellini, Victoria De Sica and others. And that brings us to another very famous case there is a film, La Dolce Vita. La Dolce Vita is the sweet time. And it is a film that uh, a number of people think is one of the superb great films of the 20th century. And it's not about Vikings per se, but in La Dolce Vita, there is a moment in time, there is a very famous building in Rome it's a palace on one side. And then you go around the other side is a fountain, a very famous fountain, which is the scene of a very famous American movie. Three coins in a fountain. Now, this fountain was also very famous because there was a fantastically beautiful Swedish actress who went into that fountain, that is, climbed over the edge, waded out. 
She was wearing a strapless and backless evening gown. Her name is Anita Eckberg. Anita Eckberg is, how to describe her? She's incredibly beautiful. And so she's there, water is falling, fountains are playing. They're not flinging three coins in a fountain. That's a very American version. And Marcella Mastrioni, a very famous Italian film star, sees her goes bananas because I'm going to tell you something about Italians. They absolutely love Scandinavian blondes. I have a very good Italian friend who will kill me for saying this. His name is Massimo Franco. He writes for a Milan Daily, very famous newspaper. He used to write for the Rome Daily, which is La Repubblica. And Massimo thinks that every woman wants to have an Italian lover. Just absolutely positive is he that everyone, and I'm just as positive that everyone wants an Irish lover. So there you are, the Irish versus the Italian. But everyone was certainly sure that Anita Eckberg was wanted by everybody to include Marcello Nostriani. So again, you have this invasion of a Swedish how to describe her. She was just incredibly beautiful. She went on also to appear in the Audrey Hepburn film, which was very bad. The film of uh, War and Peace that we made, not the great War and Peace that the Russians made, one we made, and Eden Expert was in that one also. So what can I tell you? They were Vikings, first and foremost. When they decided to settled down, they chose basically Wisconsin. You didn't have to be just in Wisconsin. But there are other things in Wisconsin. There's some beer makers in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee. There's a great university in Madison, but there are a lot of Swedes and they seem to find their home there. And they made a very big attempt to mesh with us and then they saw that we were not very successful in healthcare. So they built their own healthcare system with Senator La Follette as the cutting edge who argues at the time and was able to succeed in arguing the state of Wisconsin to build its own healthcare system since we didn't seem to be interested in one. And we have that example and Obama finally gives us health care every, for everybody. So it was a very long trek from being a Viking and raiding from one end to the other end of the world, from crossing out from Iceland to Greenland to Newfoundland, or in the other direction to St. Petersburg, down the Nipper River, to Baghdad and to Constantinople. Vikings were everywhere. And we have proof of that in that they often buried their treasure and then forgot where they buried it or they were killed and they were got to go back and pick it up. So these hordes of uh, silver and gold coins that are particularly found on islands off of Stockholm where the Vikings came and settled and put in their ore. Now, initially, they had a middle period. Very hard to explain this to people. From 1618 to 1648, there was a 30 years war that engulfed all of Europe. Again, it was basically Catholics against Protestants. Protestants against Catholics. Really amazing how the three Abrahamic, Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, spent much of their career killing each other, organized religion. So in this war, 1618 to 1648, 30 years war, the battlefield is Germany. 
central Germany is completely destroyed. Hard for you to think of that. And leading the Protestant forces from the north, from Sweden, is the king Gustavus Adolphus. And leading the Catholic forces from the point of view of the Austrian Habsburgs, who had a huge empire, Austro-Hungary and the rest, was Wallenstein. And they chose Germany as the battleground. So Austria didn't get beaten up. Sweden got beaten. The Germans had to pay the price. And they did. Central Germany was depopulated. People were starving to death. They always went to any hanging that was being held because they wanted to see what happened with the corpse. And most of the time, the people tore the corpse to pieces to eat the corpse because they were starving to death. When my mother came to Europe to visit me, I was living in Stuttgart, actually in a place in Baden-Württemberg called Ludwigsburg. It's a much nicer place than Stuttgart. Uh, Ludwigsburg was the seat of the kings of Ludwigsburg, of the whole area. And one day she said, let's go to Heidelberg to see the burning of the castle. Heidelberg has a huge castle on a hill overlooking the Neckar River. It's a very small river that connects to the Rhine, but it comes out of Stuttgart and makes its way down. And it's often used because the rivers of Germany are very well tamed so they can carry a lot of barge traffic. And many times from the Neckar River, you will see big barges loaded with Mercedes, Porsches, and Volvos. No, not Volvos. That little thing I used to drive called the Volkswagen. And they would be barged down to the Rhine and then up the Rhine. But when we were there, we weren't there to see barges full of Volvo. Of Vol Volkswagens, we were to see the burning of the castle. Because every year, in the middle of the summer, people in Heidelberg turn off all their lights. All traffic stops. So there are no headlights. And this castle, which is on the top of this cliff, to overlooking the whole of the city, is then burnt down again. You, all that you see is smoke pouring out of the building, out of the windows, out of the various parts of the building that are off to the left and right, and red light shining in it so that it looks like the building is a fire. And this is to celebrate that terrible time, 30 years war, when Heidelberg was one of the cities that was destroyed. The way to destroy it was of course, to burn down the center and the major governing bodies. And so we went in a sense of celebration. We were there, my mother was drinking a big stein of beer and everyone was eating versed, having a jolly good time watching the 30 years war several hundred years later. It was interesting to watch what the Europeans had done during that time. In the years 1618 to 1648, which was the Thirty Years' War, there was in France a very ruthless Roman Catholic cardinal, cardinal primate, who was more a politician than a cardinal. His name was Richelieu. And Richelieu watched very carefully and he saw that the Gustavus Adolphus might lose. Now in those days, the enemy of France was the Austrian Habsburg, being led now by Wallenstein. So the French led state sent all of his gold and support to Gustavus Adolphus. 
Well, you would think that the French state, which was a Roman Catholic state, would be supporting the Roman Catholic side. No, no, no. Krishna said in a very famous piece of writing, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So here this man saw that the Austrians were the great enemy of the French. And so whoever was their enemy was his friend. So French gold went to support the Protestant forces in this very long and very treacherous war. Now the king at the time, Gustavus Adolphus, had launched a very famous warship. And it didn't see very much action because it's called the Vasa, which is the name of their royal family. And it sunk almost immediately. Not a good sign of Viking seamanship. And not only did it sink, but many centuries later, it was brought back up to the surface and is now a boat that you can go on. I've been on it many times and it's there right up in the harbor in Stockholm, very big tourist attention uh, gainer. But the problem was this royal family of bosses got dingier and dingier and dingier. And suddenly the Swedish nobles said, we have to get rid of this. We will invite in a new person to be king. And so they sent out an invitation to a very famous Frenchman who was one of the marshals who had fought for Napoleon. And Napoleon was still running France, but this invitation came from the Swedish governing body that we invite you to come to Stockholm to be our king. This is all very cleverly covered in a very famous book by a woman named Anna Marie Salenko. The book's name is Daisy Ray because Daisy Ray is this woman that's being followed in the book. And she is in love with this man who is going to be invited to be the Swedish king. And so she leaves also France and goes to live in cold, wintry Stockholm. And so you get a very famous case of French policymaking that sometimes backfires. You know, the French are very famous for their revolution and they like very much for you to know all you can know about it. So, liberté, égalité, fraternité, and all of that. But they're also very famous for cutting off heads. They have a very, very famous doctor by the name of Dr. Guillotine. And he had a very famous way of chopping where you hardly felt a thing and then your head was separated from your body. Around 2,000 people went to their death that way in the Place de la Concorde, which in its day was called the Place de la Revolution. But all during this long history of war, during and after the revolution, the French gave kings to all the countries near them. So not only did they give Bernadotte, a marshal of France, to be king in Sweden, but in the wars of Louis XIV, they gave a king to be king in Spain. That's why when you hear that Franco finally decides to restore the monarchy before he gives up the ghost, you hear them calling out the name of Juan Carlos de Bourbon. And when he is replaced, by his son, Philippe de Bourbon. It's the Bourbon family, the family that Louis the 16th went to the guillotine with his Austrian wife, Marie Antoinette. So you never know where these things will mix and meet. They once were kings. Now we don't have kings anymore. 
and other people have them, but they were French, imported. So it was that they brought people from elsewhere to rule them. And still today, they have very funny ways of doing things. The uh, Swedes, the Norwegians, I told you already, Norway was part of Sweden until the 20th century. They turned into a much more peaceful country. When you didn't want to serve in the Vietnam War, which was the one war I served in, no wonder we lost. The people who didn't want to go ran away to Sweden. You either went to Sweden or Canada and you stayed there until the war was over and you were forgiven. We had a sort of great amnesty, tried to put all that behind us because Regardless of what you heard in the movie, you know, most of you didn't stay very long at Patton. Uh, you should know that Patton might have been right about when he said we never lost a war. Well, he didn't live long enough. As Renata discovered, Patton died in Heidelberg the year after the war. But if he lived long enough, he'd have lived in the Vietnam War and we lost that war. That's what's necessary to say. We lost, we lost, we lost. Therefore, we should never be so arrogant. Again, we hope. I've not yet given you my talk on Vietnam or my talk that's coming up on the, the death camps, Auschwitz, and others. That will be a very difficult one to cover, but we will do it. So I can't tell you very much more about the Vikings. They were a very powerful force. They raided all the way to Baghdad and Constantinople. In the other direction, they went all the way to Iceland, Greenland, and they discovered America before Columbus did. They left a trail of their coins. So if you're a coin expert, you can go to these troves where they have dug up things, even some of their bodies. You know, if you die in a exposed area and you sink into the muck of a peat bog, you will be preserved for a very long time. We've uh, taken up a lot of bodies. The peat is a preservative and um, in case you'd like to see a 800 year old person, go to a peat bog and keep hoping you'll find the body. It's a land also of great music. You should always remember the Scandinavians, fabulous music players from Edward Grieg in Norway, all the way over to the Finnish people. Also think of themselves as Scandinavians. They never, ever, think of themselves as Russians. They might be on the Russian border, but they're Scandinavians, true and through. So I think what I'm going to do, I think that I'm looking at a count. I'm going to let you go early so that you can run out of the room screaming, never again. Thank you very much for listening to the Vikings.